While he didn't get his coveted championship, Jimmy Butler made history this season in a historic postseason run. We can talk about him all day, but what do NBA legends have to say about Jimmy Butler? Well, we know Chuck can't say what he really wants on TV. Jimmy Butler. Yes, indeed. Well, I sure wish I was at the crib. What crib? At the any crib. Because I can say what I want to say about Jimmy Butler. I mean, to Jimmy F. and Butler. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered Damn. where you were going with uh, the whole man, rip, get, hey, that, that, Say what you want to say about hey, him on TV. Yeah, huh? I, I got to say Jimmy freaking Butler on TV. Cause, but if I was at the crib. Want to hear the best Jimmy Butler story from an NBA great? Make sure to listen until the end. J.J. Redick, one of NBA history's greatest sharpshooters, had a little more to say. During this past season, while the Heat struggled as a team, Jimmy was thriving. And this, this guy may seem like an obvious choice, but given how the team has performed this year, I think maybe there is some doubt about whether or not he gets a spot. And that guy is Jimmy Butler. Jimmy's having a fantastic season. Was actually a little surprised that he didn't make the All-Star game, to be honest with you. Um, counting stats good, over 22 a game over five assists, over five rebounds. JJ broke down his case for one of the six all NBA forward spots, getting real analytical. Is fourth in the NBA in win shares, 11.3. The guys ahead of him, this is basketball reference win, win shares. The guys ahead of him are Jokic, DeMontis Simonis, and Joel Embiid. The guys directly behind him, I'll just name the top 10, are Shea, Jason Tatum, Luca, Damian Lillard, Ja, Giannis. He's Got a career high 63.9 true shooting percentage. He's second in the NBA in win shares per 48. That's probably an even better barometer than total win shares. Then he talked about the Heat's struggles and how despite all of that, Jimmy is the reason they'd even gotten to that level. The Miami Heat, and we, we touched on this a couple weeks ago, the Miami Heat have largely underperformed this season because they can't shoot threes. Think about that. That is the re that like I really believe that that is the reason. It's the only reason that you know they haven't gotten production, you know, efficient production out of Lowry, Max Struess, Gabe Vincent, Duncan. Like there's three guys that have had good seasons for the Miami Heat. Outside of them, there's no one that has shot the ball well. The shooters have not shot the ball well. I can't. And Jimmy, by the way, has created a lot of these open looks for them. So you could argue, well, he's averaging 5.1 assists. He's probably in a normal shooting year averaging 6.5 assists. Yep. You know, and, and all these little metrics get amped up for Jimmy Butler. Jimmy Butler's had a great season, yep. and he's had his most efficient shooting season. So he, career high in two-point percentage, 35.6. He barely shoots threes, but 35.6 from three after shooting in the 20s the last two years for Miami. Jimmy Butler, to me, should have one of the six forward spots for the All-NBA. Of course, once the playoffs started, playoff Jimmy emerged. He decimated the number one seeded Bucks in five games, averaging 37.6 points per game against a team that featured three guys on the last two years all defensive first team. He kept cooking throughout the playoffs, taking his heat all the way to the finals, only the second eight seed to ever get that far. According to former All-NBA guard Gilbert Arenas, if the Heat pulled off the upset, well, hear it for yourself. If Jimmy wins the championship, he's the best player in the world, hands down. Why? Do you see who he has with him? You take Bam off, there's not a player on his team that will crack top 150 in the NBA. Don't tell me shit. I am the best player on the planet if I won with the goddamn lineup I actually have. They just got another player on that team that would start anywhere else besides ball. These boys have six, seven, and nine. Hell no. They not starting nowhere else and I, I won a championship with them. I'm the GOAT. This wasn't the first time Arena's hyped up Butler. All the way back in 2020, the other time Jimmy willed his low seated heat to a shocking finals appearance, he said that if nothing else, Jimmy Butler will always outwork everyone. Like you can see Jimmy Butler's, you know, got Miami Heat in the championship. Three other teams said he was a bad locker room guy, right? Bad locker room guy, bad locker room guy. Bad. Well, you, you, you take him to a team that likes to work <laughs> under an organization who thrives on hard work. He's amazing because what he was good at or what he, he has discipline. So when he's looking at guys like, yo, you're not disciplined enough. Yo, we need to do this. And guys like, I don't, 
You know, uh, we don't do that over here. You know, you, you get that bad name, you know, but then you put them in a winning situation or a, a situation where they thrive. Those guys need that type of. So now he has a whole bunch of players where this is not even the most talented group that he's he's ever been around. There's no other all-star on that team. There's no other superstar on that. There's not even a, a top 25 player on that team, you know, but those guys are dogs. They, they you know, let's. What do we got to do, you know, you know, and so that's why you have to understand who's who, you know, who's who in your team, personalities, the relationships, you know, you got to, you know, it's like an investment. You got to really invest in your team, knowing who they are. When Arena said three other teams said he was a bad locker room guy, he was talking about the Bulls, Timberwolves and Sixers. He was drafted onto a really good 2011 Bulls team, but by the time he began to reach his personal peak, injuries and age had torn that team apart. By the end of 2017, he was stuck with young, selfish players who didn't care about winning as much as he did. He went on to the Timberwolves, joining two talented stars in Carl Anthony Towns and Andrew Wiggins, who never had a competitive streak or a compulsion to work hard. During that 2017-18 season, he was teamed up with Jamal Crawford, owner of one of the league's sickest crossovers. Jamal was a respected vet and a beloved teammate, and he talked about that infamous incident that kicked off the T-Wolves' rocky 2018-19 campaign. You were in Minnesota with Jimmy yeah. Butler, Cat, Carl Anthony Towns, Andrew Wiggins. Yeah. Now, we want to know about what really happened at the practice. Because we got bits and pieces here, and somebody said this over there. I need to know, the, the people really want to know what really happened and how did it happen at the practice. I was gone at that point. Remember, I only stayed one year. Okay. But Jimmy called me. Okay. He said, man, if you could have been at this practice here. They said he came in there. He came to the practice, I believe, after it got started. And they were kind of shocked to see him because I think he's come off an injury or something. He came in there. And I'm going to tell you the coldest part, and I don't know if Jimmy said this. I think he had his Rolex on while he was killing everybody with the ball. <laughs> I think he had a Rolex watch on while he was killing people, picking them apart in practice, and walked off the field. It was classic from what I heard. Imagine getting torched against a guy with a Rolex watch on. Jimmy F. and Butler. <laughs> Then, the young Timberwolves labeled Jimmy as the villain and sent him to Philly in a don't let the door hit you on the way out type of trade. It happened again with the 76ers the next season, leading to the famous line. Tobias Harris over me? According to Crawford, that's the best thing that could have happened to Jimmy. Why don't you think Jimmy worked in Minnesota? I think Jimmy, knowing him and playing with him, Jimmy's all about hard work. He's all about getting better. He's all about team. And if he doesn't feel that from everybody, then he's already rubbed off the wrong way. You gotta remember, Jimmy's a self-made superstar. Right. Juco, you know, had to really grind. If you know his situation, what he had to come up through, he wasn't one that was you know, a prodigy as a kid and, and like knew what this was going to be. He he made himself, even when he came to Chicago, he's a defender first. He got minutes right. by being a defender. So he respects the grind. I say that to say this. He respects the grind. He respects the game. He respects people that put the work in and he respects no agendas. It's all about winning. And, and when he went to um, Miami, I told him, I said, you were built for Miami 20 years ago. You didn't even know it, but the way everything you stand for and what you're about and how they go about their business. He was a Miami Heat player. So is Jimmy to blame for the failure of the 2010 Bulls, the collapse of the Timberwolves, or the rocky breakup of the Sixers? Or did the last four years prove that he is the definition of a winning player? It's clear Jamal thinks the latter. All those things, you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to make every shot. But you're gonna try hard, you're gonna put your team first, and you're gonna work hard. And if you don't do those things, Jimmy's off you. So he's a hard worker. He's one of the most efficient players in the league. The advanced stats love him, and he's a winning player. What else makes him so special? Let's check in with Paul George, LA Clippers superstar. Jimmy just has like, he just has this will that you just, you can't teach. He's got mm -hmm. a will to win. Like not many guys play at that level and have that much passion wrapped around winning. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really what edges him over the top. You know, you watch him play and it's not like you're watching a crazy crossover or you're not watching a you know crazy you know layup like everything is just solid like he just plays the game the right way fundamentally and then he just competes every time you watch him on the court it's like all right he wants it like each possession he wants it and that, that's what's edging him over the top and as your leader if you watch somebody like that you fall in line i think his leadership is not just is getting talked about enough like his leadership i, I think that's that's the most surprising or or not even surprising but that's the part that i think is his biggest trait 
as a player is his leadership. Because of that competitive streak and that innate leadership Jimmy has, George says that all of his teammates have been overperforming by their standards. Caleb Martin, like, he's not known to be doing what he's doing, but look, he's rising to the occasion. Mm -hmm. Like, Max Struess, Gabe Vincent, like, these are guys that, you know, were undrafted, Duncan Robinson, and yet playing at a high level. And, and they're following Jimmy's, you know, steps. Bam out of bio, following Jimmy's steps. So I think his leadership is, is just the most impactful thing that's going on over there. If you're looking to compare Jimmy to any Hall of Famer, Reggie Miller might not be the first to come to mind. Reggie made a career off hitting big threes, but Dan Patrick thinks their understanding of when to step up gave them a similar career path. Who does Jimmy Butler remind you of? Kind of reminds me of that black cat a little bit. He has that attitude. Um, no, he, he reminds me of you. Me? Yes, because regular season, he'll get you yes. 18, yes. 19 a game. Postseason, yes. he just kind of cranks it up a notch as another in that, level. In terms of that, yes. Look, I just looked at the season in the big picture. There were certain games during the regular season, maybe 10 or so that you get up for that are big. But in whole, you just want to be playing well, build chemistry, numbers really didn't matter for me. Postseason, give me the ball and let's go to work. And I always try to build up my fitness towards the second half of the year. And I think the heat culture is somewhat like that, but Jimmy is like that. Jimmy, it's all about performing when the lights and the stage is the brightest and the biggest. And to me, it's his supporting cast. These dudes would die. They would run through brick wall for him. And that's what I love. I love seeing the supporting cast thrive off of what Jimmy Butler and how he sets them up. When Hall of Famers talk, we listen. So when Reggie Miller touts Jimmy's leadership, it means something. But when Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce, two champions and among the greatest players in the history of the league, hype up Jimmy Butler. You know he's special. What you think that is, Pete? I'm cast his bill for the lights. You know who Jimmy Butler. Jimmy Buckets. Jimmy, Jimmy Butler. Hey, I'm calling him playoff buckets no, now, yo. Look, he be in the regular season. Right. I ain't saying he coasting. He is, though. I'll look at his line <laughs> at the end of that day. He'll show you something. Yeah, then get yeah, off yeah. it. We're Playoffs come around. He he man. All the big shots he take off. Oh, listen, Jimmy nah, Butler. he a whole dude. nother man. Giannis I mean, does it. Middleton does it a little bit too. Not on the same Shit. level Jimmy Butler though. Yeah, not the coasting. Nah, nah Middleton nah. has like a peak. You know what I'm saying? I hear some big shots and I'm talking yeah. about healthy too, right? This Middleton this year been kind of like iffy with the injuries and stuff but his consistency to me when he get to the playoffs he hit big shots because you know playoffs everything get bigger, right? Jimmy Butler go from regular season Jimmy Butler it's like it's a big face. It's a big face coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one NBA great we need to hear from. A player who went to the same college is Jimmy, a player who battled his Bulls teams from 2012 to 2014, a player who spent a season playing with Jimmy, and the player who led those Miami Heat to their other five finals. So I used to go back and play with the guys in the summer every now and again, and Jimmy, you know, he was a hustle man. He was kind of, you know, the guy who defend, knock down some corner threes, but I didn't really think nothing of Jimmy like that. And so the draft comes, and Jimmy get drafted 30th pick. And I say, wow, good for Jimmy. Like, good for Jimmy. He made it in the NBA. Didn't think he was going to be that good. And then, first couple years in Chicago, my guy's on the bench. I see him over there with that weak fro, and I'm like, there go my guy Jimmy. But <laughs> Jimmy don't talk to me because Thibodeau didn't like the heat, so Jimmy never yeah. talked to me. So I see Jimmy out in L.A. I don't know if Jimmy remembers. I seen Jimmy, Jimmy out in L.A. at, like, one of the parties, like, for, like, SB weekend, whatever the case may be. And Jimmy don't speak to me at all. I'm like, dang, that's, that was my, okay, whatever. He so he changed, he, he changed on me. So it goes from me saying, damn, good for Jimmy, to me having to call Jimmy at some point later on in my career and say, hey man, can I come to Chicago? Can I play with you? <laughs> there are a lot of players in the league that NBA greats don't respect, but the best of the best have a few things in common. They care more than everyone else. They're innate leaders. They come in and do the work every day. And above all, they will do anything to win in this league. They all point to Jimmy Buckets and say, that guy's doing it right. Maybe he's not the most athletic, maybe he's not the best shooter, the most skilled, whatever. But he's undoubtedly a born winner. Let's hear from one last person, a guy who sums up the Jimmy Butler experience like no one else, Kevin Harlan. Ed Orford, shot clock at three, Butler with Brogdon on him, it's a long three. <laughs> NBA legends hype him up, but he doesn't get his due. Do you think Jimmy's the most underrated player in the league? Let us know in the comments. For more NBA content, check out The Wrong Opinion, useless NBA trivia, and garbage rankings wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for watching Hooper's Lane.